Have you been considering strip tillage on your farm? This six part video series is gonna look at the equipment, the economics, and how to make strip tillage work for you. In this video, we'll talk to some of our farmers about the different kinds of strip tillage equipment available, as well as their recommendations for farmers wanting to make the transition into strip till. I'm Mike Cornelson, producer. Hi, I'm Warren Schneckenberger. Farm here just outside of Morrisburg, Ontario on our farm name Cedar Lodge Farms. Christine Schneckenberger. Uh, I grew up in Brant County. I moved up here to Morrisburg when I met Warren. Um, and I have farmed with you for the past five years, you and your dad and mom. So Warren and Christine, how did you, as you get started to get into strip till, how did you get familiar with the different pieces of equipment out there and, and make a decision on which unit you wanted to go with? We spent about six years um, going to conferences, speaking to producers, learning as much as we could before jumping in on anything. Uh, through that, we settled on a Coulter machine, um, which from talking with other producers from not just in Ontario, but across North America, um, we, we knew with our rocky soil and our shallow soil that a shank likely wasn't going to work for us, particularly in the spring. So we, uh, we settled on, on a Coulter machine. So carrying on from that question, do you have any mentors that, uh, that you followed that got you to where you are? Yeah, there definitely was uh, mentorship, May, perhaps not an individual or a uh, maybe even a group of individuals, but it was a lot of relationship building over that six year journey, trying to educate ourselves on why we wanted to strip till and how it would help us. So there's a lot of talk about Coulter's versus shank machines and how did you gain the experience that led you to the, the Coulter machine and, and what are the things that others have to consider as they start this journey? Yeah, uh, that's a can of worms that uh, you could get strip tillers to argue for for weeks over. Uh, so we, we had uh, side dressed our corn with anhydrous ammonia for decades. And so we are well, well familiar with what pulling a shank through our soil is like. And we were successful with anhydrous. And I, I think we could have been successful with a strip, shank strip tiller, but with stones, spring shear bolts, broken springs, downtime. And also with our clay soil in a wet time of year, like late fall or, or trying to get a crop in the ground a year like 2017 or even 2019 come to mind with fighting weather systems, a shank would, we would probably have struggled in our soils. Um, so the Coulter is, a, I think, a lot more forgiving, but there's, there's definitely pluses and minuses to each. Uh, fertility placement, it, it's, it's, a, it's a broad topic that with a lot of avenues. And what would your advice to, to new entrants into strip till be in terms of making that choice? Know your soil, know your subsoil, know what kind of tillage you want to do if you want deep or if you're satisfied with just the, the six to 10 inches that ours does to make the nice seed bed. And have you guys ran a shank machine here since having bought this one? Uh, no, no, we, uh, we, well, we're quite pleased with the job our unit does. Um, I have participated in a soil and crop strip tillage field day. So we were able to run side by side with two or three, I believe, shank machines. They did a very good job, but not in our soils. We were in some class one, beautiful silty loam topsoil that uh, a shank would thrive in. So a big question guys have talking about strip till equipment, especially, you know, if you're new and getting into it, uh, the question whether you need a shank machine or you can get by with, you know, some of the benefits of a, a Coulter machine being easier to pull and that sort of thing. You guys have run both pieces of equipment. What would your, uh, what would your comments be on that question, Gary? Um, the Coulter system uh, requires less, quite a bit less horsepower. We could pull a 40 foot unit versus the shank machine is only a 30 foot unit. Um, speeds were higher with the Coulter system, but soil 
didn't move the way we wanted to in the culture system. It wasn't, uh, we weren't making as uniform uh, berms that we were looking for. Yeah, so a bit more to get into the, the shank system, but uh, a lot nicer seabed quality. A lot nicer seabed quality. It was like, uh, this spring was like a, we were planting into a garden. It was perfect. Yeah, so we started with the shank unit. Um, it worked really well for us. Um, then a culture unit came out for a demo, so we thought we'll give it a try. We were really happy how the culture unit handled cover crops, so then we decided to purchase a culture unit. Um, we actually owned a culture unit and a shank unit overlap for multiple years, so we were able to do a lot of plots over the years, comparing both the culture and shank unit. Uh, after all the plots, we found there was no yield advantage to one or the other. I would say it's a wash, a little bit year to year, but overall a wash. We did many reps, many fields, etc. Um, the other thing we, the big thing, the reason why it put us back to a shank unit, culture units I think are really good for spring. They can be fairly good in the fall, but if you're too dry, they're a little bit, it's hard to get in the ground. If it's too wet, they plug. Um, at least with a shank unit, they struggle in wet conditions as well, but they can handle the drier conditions. Um, and that was the main reason why we moved back to shank with us being primarily fall strips behind wheat stubble. It's normally you're gonna hopefully get a dry stripping and that's why we went back to the shank unit. So some more versatility for you guys. Yeah, because we were fall strips mostly. If you're doing a lot of spring strips, and then I would think a culture unit might be a better fit, so. Ken, tell us a bit about your experience with shank versus culture machines. What have you found and what would be your advice to growers just starting out? Uh, so we have run both. We started on a shank machine, uh, ran it for about five or six years until the row units got pretty well whipped. And, uh, and then actually changed the row units on the bar that we still own uh, to a coulter style. Um, I guess the litmus test a little bit for me is uh, if you are in a soil that you are comfortable doing primary tillage in the spring, in other words, can you successfully spring plow and, and reliably get a crop? If you have a soil type that you can do that on, then I would say that a shank you can use universally, you know, spring and fall. For us, we, we needed a little bit of versatility in terms of being able to uh, possibly strip in the spring in our soil type. Uh, we cannot, we have a soil type that we uh, uh, just cannot do uh, spring primary tillage with and so a shank machine in the spring for us was a, was a, a no-go and that was part of the reason or the main reason really uh, why we switch from a shank to a to a coulter. Um, if if you are sure that you're going to get everything done in the fall and you are on a heavier soil type, then for sure a shank machine is great. They're cheaper to run, they're cheaper to buy than a coulter. Uh, but otherwise, uh, uh, a coulter uh, again gives you the versatility of spring and fall uh, on on maybe heavier soil types. So again, going back to when you guys first started, Gary, did you guys, uh, did you do some test strips just to get an evaluation when you're thinking about the system, comparing it to what you guys were doing previously? Uh, yep, we did some, uh, we came from a plow to spring pass cultivator setup, like a lot of Ontario is. And uh, so we did some side-by-sides, did some uh, evaluation on cost and savings and stuff of like that. And, and uh, did yield yield checks, and we were about even on the yield checks, but felt we were still not at a complete system approach from strip till to planting uh, the way we wanted it, and we've refined that over time. And uh, our our data says that we could give up about 11 bushels an acre at today's price on corn, and there's there's we haven't lost a a bushel. In terms of those 11 bushels being the savings you have from your old system to? Savings from old system to, to strip to system. Using, uh, using uh, custom rates for everything. So when you guys first did those first couple of trials, what did you use to evaluate whether or not strip till would be successful for you? Evaluated cost of production, um, passes that you made, amount of equipment that we used, uh, in both systems and uh, basically cost of production. Fertility is uh, a little cheaper on the strip till system, an overall fertility system, and, uh, and equipment. 
And yield wise? Yield wise was no change. Pretty comparable? Pretty comparable to a conventional system. How has adopting the strip till system changed your labor needs? So, uh, uh, we again, we've, we've transferred a lot of things that used to happen in the spring in terms of tillage fertilizer application and all those sorts of things and move that into, at least with us in a, fall till, in a fall strip system, have moved that, a lot of that labor into the uh, August, September time period. Uh, so that, that's been a huge boost to us. We do not have any hired help. Uh, basically my brother and I, uh, with some help from an aging dad who basically, you know, moves seed around and, and moves uh, 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 supply infrastructure around uh, can can knock in a pile of crop in the in the spring uh, with just basically a very modest labor force. So as conditions change for you guys stripping, say you know fall versus springtime, different previous crops, or if you move to farms with different soil textures, Mike, um, do you find yourselves making any adjustments to the strip tiller at all for those? Yeah, so we actually personally have never ran our shank unit in the spring. Um, we had our coulter unit, uh, we would run the coulter unit six inches in the fall, about two inches in the spring. Um, so when, and then now with this unit, probably our biggest adjustment is between cover crops and no cover crops. Uh, when we're in cover crops, we need to run our row cleaners a little bit more aggressive, try to get a little bit more residue out of the way, trying to allow that soil uh, to break up a little bit. Because the biggest thing with cover crops is if you have a good root mass, that soil does not want to explode and make that nice fluffy strip. Um, so another thing is trying to get more speed out and I think speed is more important when you have cover crops and out of cover crops just to get that shattering action of the soil and I think that's the biggest things we change. So, so when you're fall strip tilling, uh, you know, what to you, what does a good fall strip look like? What do you need in the fall? Uh, what we look for is uh, like to move the residue over and uh, we found our machine works best about the five inch depth. We don't want our fertilizer any deeper than that for sure. And we want a unit that lifts the soil, contains it, and just softly pack the berm down, not push it down, but just, you know, break a few or the bigger lumps up and, and you're good to go. Mother Nature will take care of the rest. So some guys talk about, you know, in terms of, you know, fineness of that strip. Uh, you know, in the springtime, obviously a, a fine strip is important from a seabed quality perspective. But do you find that's important in the fall or can you get away with a chunkier strip that'll mellow out? Uh, you can get away with a chunkier strip that mellows out. It'll mellow out as long as your soil's all contained in that spot. It'll, it'll mellow out by spring and, and uh, that's what we found anyway. So. so you said you like the one pass fall system. Do you ever find there's conditions or situations where you really want to go in and back in, in the springtime again? Not at all, no. It's, uh, all our nutrients are down there and you built the proper berm in the fall, there's no reason to come back in the spring at all. So Mike, you talk about your preferences more towards fall strip till. When you're making that fall strip, you know, what are you looking for? What do you need in that berm? Yeah, so the most important thing I think with a fall strip is consistency. Uh, since we're a stale seabed in the spring, we want a smooth um, seabed for the planter for performance, uh, for consistent seed depth. Uh, we don't mind a little bit of chunks in it, but you don't want bare spots in the strip where you have a hole and you don't want a hail. Like, as long as it's consistent, it can be consistently a little chunky, but it's just about being consistent. So Mike, you talked a little bit about what a good strip would look like in the fall for you guys, but you guys are also making spring strips. What's an ideal spring strip look like to you? Yeah, so when we were doing spring strips, uh, I think you want to look, and it's a little bit different situation. You don't have the winters or break down those chunks, so it needs to be a more fine strip. Uh, you don't want air pockets in it. Um, so that's why we like going a little bit more shallow to make sure you have more of a, the right conditions in that soil because it doesn't have the winter to fix itself, let's call it. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking for. Like if you run your field cultivator, that's what you, in the spring, you want your spring strip to almost like a similar looking finish. And, uh, and what we like to do when we did do spring strips is you just work basically above the seed. So we're placed, let's say we work down two and a half inches, we want to place that seed at two and three quarters. So you're still getting that seed into a, a virgin soil. So you have no uh, damaged soil underneath the roots and hopefully a loose soil um, bed above the, the plant just to get it emerged quicker. So Mike, how do you think uh, your new 
or your strip-till placement of fertilizer compares to broadcasting fertilizer prior in your no-till situation? Yeah, so when we just broadcast fertilizer in our no-till situation, we felt like the fertilizer was not getting incorporated. We had no tillage in our system. We were no-till corn, we were no-till beans, we were no-till wheat. Uh, so the strip till is allowing us to get the fertilizer in the soil. It's very good for environmental reasons. And it's also allowing the roots to get to it. And because fertilizer moves very slow in the soil, so we want to make sure we put it close as we can to where the plant needs it. So before strip till, was, was your fertilizer custom done or were you doing it yourself? And, and how have you found that has, has changed or not with strip till? Uh, so before, before we uh, adopted strip till, uh, we, we were still doing it ourselves, uh, essentially broadcasting uh, potash uh, with a spreader on wheat stubble, which was where most of our potash went. Our phosphorus, uh, either it was going through uh, dry boxes on the planter uh, or it was being broadcast as well. Uh, we've just, we, we still do it all ourselves. Uh, uh, most of our P and, or half of our P and K goes down with a strip till rig. Uh, and a lot of the rest of our phosphorus goes on with our air seeder uh, with wheat. So um, we're, we're still doing most of it ourselves, but it has changed uh, dramatically from broadcast to, to more so of a, of a band placement. How is your feeling for the appearance of your strip till crops throughout the growing seasons? You know, especially in years where we've got dry or you know, other stresses in those growing seasons. Uh, this year in particular, our crops look, and the strip till systems look much more uniform than a conventional system. Uh, so we less compaction uh, is probably the big thing and we're not disturbing the soil of any way other than planting into a berm that has not had any traffic on it. And so our, we've, and our nutrients are down below the, below the plant and so our, our corn is much more uniform than in a conventional system. So what would you say about the appearance of your crops now that you've moved to strip till, you know, throughout the whole growing season compared to what you were previously doing? Yeah, so our uh, strip till corn and the uh, wheat stubble is definitely a more uniform stand. Um, it's quicker at the gate. Uh, we're planting it now, uh, strip till corn and wheat stubble earlier, where like, probably our first planted corn versus our last planted corn. So just it's more advanced stage crop. Um, it's a healthy looking crop. I think that's because we're still getting that no-till or conventional or uh, conservation tillage benefit of the soil. Um, so that's the main things we're seeing. It's just a healthier crop. Yield-wise, we're in there with anybody else. Um, yeah, I think we're getting all the benefits of everything with the strip-till system. So Mike, what would be your, uh, your comments for any growers considering or thinking about going to strip-till? Yeah, so anyone that's looking at going strip-till, uh, I would start simple, start with the tillage part of it. I do think the biggest part for us now is the fertilizer to it, but start with the strip, just the, the actual tillage part. Still do fertilizer, just put it on the surface if you want and just slowly work into it. I do think matching the width of your strip tiller, your planter is a good way to start as well. It does simplify things. Um, and another thing we kind of learn and you don't think about it is hopefully you can have the same operator run your strip tiller as your planter. Because when you're in the spring, you got to think how your strip tiller guy worked around the field. Because if it's two different people, and we learned this the hard way, it's hard to know what corner he started in, what side of the headland he did first. Because you want to work the same way just for backing in corners and how to make sure everything works nice and smooth through the field.